Goombella is the first partner you have access to in Paper Mario with a thousand year door. Without Mario, she's kind of just a one trick pony, and I'm not just talking about her ponytail. She's really only good at head bonking and not much else, and that's going to be really limiting when it comes to spiky enemies and anything that really just cannot be attacked from above without some kind of protection. Compared to Koops, there really isn't much else to say about Goombella, so we're really just getting to the run right now. So I'll just say, if you want to check out the rules, they're all in the description down below. And because I really want you to feel like you're involved in this challenge as well, I want you to guess in the comments down below. What level do you think I'll be at the end of the video? Say so in the comments below. And now, it's showtime! Being that Goombella is the very first partner we have access to, she also has the most of the game to cover herself. Now, in my Koops only run, which you can check out in the card in the top right corner after the video is over, I made it a point to try using Super Guards as few times as possible. As in theory, any fight is possible as long as you can just avoid taking damage for long enough, and Super Guards enable you to do just that. But the main reason I'm bringing this up now is because we have already found a fight that we absolutely cannot get past without using items in battle. And the only items you can just scavenge from the ground, or at least in block, you get the idea, can only be obtained after this battle battle is over with, so we are already forced to buy a Fire Flower from the Toad Bros Bazaar. Why? Take a look at the spiky Goomba. Goombella cannot head bonk it, even though you'd think that with that helmet, she should be spike proof. But no, it's just for show, or maybe it actually just makes it so that she can do damage with all of her head bonks. Maybe it's to prevent recoil? I don't freaking know. I do know this is at least skippable thanks to a clip that was displayed by FatGuy703, but there is very little reason to actually go for it myself, because there absolutely will be a time later in the game where we absolutely will need to buy items anyway. And trust you me, that time is not far off. So I swallow my pride and take our first penalty in this challenge by buying a Fire Flower. Now it's time to challenge the first boss in this challenge, the blooper guarding the way to Paddle Meadows' is pipe. All around, it is not a tough fight. He only has an attack point of one, so if you guard, you won't have to worry about taking any damage off of the entire thing. Unfortunately, it is impossible to do this in a single cycle, and he will have to come back up to the ceiling before you can finish him off. But that's really it. This fight is otherwise not noteworthy in the slightest. I do take a lot of damage from this battle, but it's mainly because I'm not necessarily in practice when it comes to this boss. Like, I very rarely ever really fight it, and I'm not well accustomed to the guard's timing. It is also kind of annoying how the blooper tentacles have 3 HP and Gubella's head bunk at max only do only 2, but when the most of it worries is just that the boss can be a bit inconvenient, then there really is not much else to talk about here. Chapter 1 involved a ton of item usage, and that's because this game really wants to hammer in that items are going to be very useful throughout the game, and there's a lot of enemies with defense that necessitates the power blocks that are available in Chapter 1 just before Sri Lanka Fortress. So the two that we can't find in the entire game have to already be exhausted in both the ball clefts as well as the bristles here. The mini boss in Strong Fortress being the gold fuzzy, however, doesn't really have that problem. You just have to keep guarding, keep head bonking away, and eventually you do win the fight. But the Fire Flower that you find in Roadport Sewers, as well as the Fire Flower just before the Flaunt Bust in Shuang Fortress are absolutely required to deal with Red Bones in Hooktail Castle. You do still have a mystery item, however, in your inventory, but you're better off saving it for Chapter 3 instead of using it here in Chapter 1. We are now free to raid Hooktail Castle, rank up Gumbel with the Shining Sprites we find, and buy a Flower Saver Peak from Dazzle. On the Hooktail herself, she was actually a very easy boss this time around, thanks to having Mega Rush P in my inventory. Really, the only concern was getting myself to a point where I had only one hit point left, and then just spamming multi-bonk and head-bonk accordingly. As you can see, Goombella's multi-bonk is capable of doing some ridiculous damage with enough power behind it, enough to clear bosses of all their HP in mere seconds. And it paints a really clear picture just how wild Goombella's damage output really is compared to how much range she has to attack. She can only focus on one target at a time, but when she does, she hits hard. Early in the game, it's excessive. Later on, however, it just may be what we need to have a chance. Beginning Chapter 2 and the Shadow Slimers are upon us. Our first encounter with them goes very smoothly. What you want to do is target Beldum first, but don't knock her HP below 5. If you do that, then she'll command her sisters to use their elemental attacks as well. And those can't be guarded whatsoever. In fact, only Beldums can, which I think is kind of weird, but oh well. Thanks to having access to multi bonk, that's not really a problem. As after the first headbonk knocks her down to 5 HP, multi bonk can finish her off no problem with at least 4 hits. After that, the order you eliminate the Shadow Sirens is inconsequential, but I would recommend knocking out Marilyn second just because she has the highest attack stat, and Vivian last because she's mostly harmless. As for Magnus von Grapple, he is also a very easy boss. Thanks to Damage Dodge, you don't have to worry about taking any damage at all from the smothering stunt that Magnus has on his disposal. Once the x bits come out, however, attack one of them, and then just spam multi bonk until Magnus von Grapple goes down. This boss is considered a joke for various reasons. I'm pretty sure you can guess why. Now it's Chapter 3. And this chapter has a lot, and I mean a lot of enemies, that you just need to buy items for. 
Let's count them all. Let's see, there's Pokies, Lakithus if only for their Spinies, the Mind Bogglers if only because of the Piranha Plant, the obvious exception would be Iron Clefts, the Red Spike Tops, the second pair of Bristles, Dark Crawl, and the Heckin Koopinator. On the other hand, there's also Bowser. And despite the obvious two horns that he has, he's not spiky. So just three multi bonks later, and he's done. You'd think the King of the Koopas would be a lot more foreboding than this, but he really isn't that hard. Yeah, Mario's HP ended up being pretty dang low, but that was mainly because of getting weakened by the Magic Koopa Masters previous. By the way, if you saw that mystery, this would be the time to use it because there really aren't any future enemies that you want to really save it for. Around this time, we also get the Charge P badge, and this badge will be an absolute godsend for the fight with Rock Hawk. His fight is actually really straightforward until he reaches about 13 or less HP, and that's because at that HP range, he'll start grabbing onto the ceiling. Goombella cannot target him on the ceiling, so you have to be a little bit more cautious on your approach. Keep his HP above 13, then use Charge a couple of times. If you have Power Plus B equipped, however, you only have to charge once. One 5-hit multi bonk later, and he's gone. Monster Grumble was a little too silly for my liking, though. When he started making himself dodgy, increasing his evasion, I just kept using Charge until he stopped being dodgy, and later on in the fight, an audience boo made him invisible for a turn. Once I finished charging, though, I was just one multi bunk away, and the battle was over, just like that. Yeah, combine Charge for and multi bunk, and you've got basically a nuclear weapon in your arsenal. Check the force creeping up on us now, and we have to battle both Atomic Boo as well as Dupless. And I am mentioning Atomic Boo for the first time because I was not going to battle him if it's an optional boss fight with a character that can only target enemies on the ground and Atomic Boo is in the air. Makes sense, right? Well, Atomic Boo was also very straightforward. I just used Bolty Buck a bunch of times, and then afterwards his health got so low I, used, I could finish him up with a normal head bonk. And Dupless was no harder. In fact, he's considered the easiest boss fight in the entire game. After spending the first two turns multi locking, he transforms, and that leads him to do even less damage now. It's like Goombario says in Paper Mario 64, Dupla Ghosts are better fighters when they don't transform. Now this is technically the boss fight of Chapter 4, but we have another fight with him that's supposed to be at the very end of the chapter. But with Goombella, we can't fight him with only her because if we do, the game would crash since you're not supposed to have Goombella by the time you fight him a second time. In fact, she's separated from Mario until the end of the chapter. I'm really sorry about this, but just like with the Iron Clefts, another exception has to be made here. You'll just have to wait until my Deviant only run when I do that challenge in the future. And if you want to see that challenge for yourself when it's out, please subscribe and click the bell notifications. I understand that my attitude has been pretty dang bad lately, but I'm really trying to work on it and making it better. I'm sorry I'm scaring you with it, and I am working on improving it, I promise. So subscribe. I promise you will not regret it. Now for Chapter 5, and Chapter 5 again has enemies that you require buying items to be able to get past. Namely, there are three sets of Embers, an enemy that is based on being fire. Do yourself a favor and make sure you remember to bring some Thunder Rages with you. If you don't, good luck getting past the first row of Embers because you have no way of attacking them directly because Goombella's head bonk will not work. Afterwards, however, you can buy Ice Storms and they're super effective against the Embers, so you at least have that going for you. Even without these enemies, Chapter 5 is definitely where this game turns up the heat in terms of being difficult. Let's move on to Cortez. This is not a fun fight, and if you see my Coops only video, well, that's gonna be especially clear. Ignoring my personal lack of experience of darting this guy's attacks, there was even some mildly bad luck here, like how I once had the light fixture fall on him, and I just could not attack him because Goombella would not be able to attack him more than once after she tried and she'd take damage and recoil. And I didn't have charge equipped either, so yeah, I was just a sitting duck. I mean, fortunately, he couldn't really do any damage to me because my defense was so high, but it was kind of awkward not being able to do anything just because of that happening to me. This feels like one of those battles I really should have thought to have Mega Rush P equipped, but I just didn't, and I don't really know why I didn't, because it'd be fantastic here. Damage can build up very quickly, especially in the second and third phases when he has his charged attack and all of his weapons fighting alongside him when he's not holding them. But the bottom line is, my lack of consistency is really what was doing me in. Like, I was actually missing guards and stuff like the Claw, which I normally never do miss, and getting poisoned by that Claw can really, really suck for you. Both times I lost to him, I could not even get to the point where Cortez would eat the audience's souls. I do have to say though, having two attack compared to only having one attack, comparing with that defense set that he has, it really goes a very long way in making this fight easier. Less multi bunks are required to deal more damage more quickly, and not only that, but it means less turns to be spent using charge. And the less time you have to spend worrying about Cortez's hook and his swords, the better. This is the first boss fight where I really had to think about what badges I had equipped since Hooktail, because the way the fight is designed is just a lot harder for me to autopilot in it. 
and then there's Lord Crumpetus Cross Knots. This fight was actually not very difficult. Ideally, eliminate the Cross Knots early because they do a frightening amount of damage otherwise. In the first phase, Lord Crook can only choose to either resummon them or attack himself. So take advantage of that and just take them out as quickly as you can. Phase 2, however, can be a little bit dicey though, just because of how much damage he can do with his Cross Knot Ball. This attack also, just like the Atomic Boo Breath, is another attack where you can't just press A or B once, but you have to press it twice in accordance to both your partner and Mario to both guard effectively. But like I said before, it's not hard, and we win on our first try. Chapter 6 is up next, and at the end of the row we have to battle Smorg. This fight could have the potential to be very, very obnoxious if it wasn't for the fact that you have access to getting an Earthquake from Twilight Trail as well as a Thunder Rage from Riverside Station. But ideally, you would have used the Thunder Rage in Chapter 5, so it's a good thing that you get a Chapter 4 Earthquake for here because you really are going to want to take out those Miyazmas as fast as possible. The game plan here is just to guard the Miyazmas while you just spam charge. If you're good at this game and like me, you won't have to worry about getting knocked up by the Miyazmas because you're actually going to guard them all. But me? No, I just cannot for the life of me get consistent guards here at all. I actually ended up losing once. But all you really need to do is charge until your attack set is up to 12 and then multi-bonk for at least 5 hits. Before you multi-bonk however, make sure you use your Earthquake to eliminate the Miyazmas even if it doesn't attack Smorg itself. This is because Miyazmas actually give Smorg infinite defense unless it's the Claw. In a fight that I dare say well overstated its welcome, it doesn't really take too long to finish if you know what you're doing. It's just that I'm really out of practice, and even if I was in practice, this is not a fight that I have very much experience with either. You also may have noticed I have a fourth move now in Rally Wink, and this move is also completely useless for me, so just understand that if you're raking it with Merlin again, it's mainly for the extra attack power, because giving an extra turn to Mario doesn't really help you whatsoever. Just like that, we already have six crystal stars. Man, this game just came and went. Just like my notoriety from doing Pokemon challenges. Chapter 7 features only one boss that is Magnus Von Grapple 2. This fight could have went wrong in two ways. Either because I did not calculate my HP correctly and I had two HP instead of just one left so Mega Rush P was not a factor at all, or the fog that the shy guy would summon would end up making me miss. Fortunately, neither of those two ended up biting me in the butt. And thanks to Charge P, this fight did not last long whatsoever. But you know something, the first seven chapters are child's play. No, no. What you really came to this video for is chapter eight. It's featuring a bunch of bosses with high attack and high HP, and a very high chance of failure. Without further ado, let's talk about Chapter 8. A day with Dark Bones is waiting for us, and it's here that I finally use my mystery. The way this fight is loaded out, you have to deal with 4 Dry Bones and a single Dark Bones. The Dry Bones having 8 HP, the Dark Bones having 20. Because Kumbella can only target a single enemy at a time, and spending too much time with one of them being collapsed will allow them to reanimate, you really have to be able to hit them all at once in order to make any progress in this fight. Ideally, use a couple of shooting stars and then multi-bunk the Dark Bones and you win the battle like that. You really only need one offensive item, but I had a spare, so I figured I may as well use it. Basically because I'm a very compulsive buyer. And if that does not satisfy you, just wait until we fight Gloomtail. This boss is a toughie. With 80 HP, 8 attack, and a slew of moves that can very easily wipe Mario out, you absolutely need at minimum 15 HP to survive this fight. His first attack will always be poisonous breath, and that does 8 damage. With P down D up and good guarding, you can drop the damage for Mario to 6, allowing him to survive with only 9 HP left. But this is literally just enough for him to survive the incoming Earthquake when he falls to 48 HP or less. Miss a single guard on Mario, and it's game over. My first couple of attempts, I was having trouble because Gloomta would either use Poison Breath more than once since he always will use them the first turn, or he would bite, which Goombella cannot guard whatsoever. To win this battle, I had to take exactly 34 damage. 24 coming from the Poison Breath, a Stomp, and a Bite. By the time my HP falls this low, I can do just enough damage after charging so much to put Gloomtail into a damage range where he will always use Earthquake. Thanks to P up D down P, I will take 10 damage from guarding the move, leaving me at 1 HP left. Being that we're now in peril, one more multi-bonk seals the deal. With Kubella having only one hit point, I proceed to enter the Riddle Tower. Battling the bones there, I take the time to increase Mario's HP to get it maxed out again while leaving Kubella at 1 HP for the next fight with the Shadow Sirens. This fight I find very annoying because of how much RNG is involved. Namely because of Marilyn. You cannot guard her lightning, just like in Chapter 2. However, you want to target Marilyn second. Beldum's Icy Wind otherwise will be able to hit both Mario and Goombella for about 5 damage, and she will always use it turn 1. With that in mind, ideally eliminate her first, because at least there will be a chance that Marilyn will not try to use Lightning and instead will just target Mario with her Clap Attack. 
Singles for duples with his headbutt. Is it cheesy to use Paragumbala here? Yes. But honestly, when you're dealing with three different opponents, and one of them has a move that completely ignores one of your basic abilities in the game to guard, I don't really care. Now, just before I forget, special thanks to Brace Mono for being a $10 channel member. And if you would like to become a channel member, just check the description down below for more information on about that. And now for Grotus. This fight is hard. Because Grotus starts with a shield turn one, and you always have to eliminate more Grotus Xs to be able to break it, and he always spawns more every time you actually knock out some of them, you absolutely need to use items in battle to even be able to dent him. Fortunately, you're given plenty of offensive items within the Palace of Shadows, so that's not really a problem. No, the problem is just how much damage Grotus can do with his attacks, as well as his Grotus Xs if you don't have enough defense on you. And all of his attacks can pierce, so you really can't do much to negate the damage he can do, especially not to Mario. On the upside, this fight does not take very long to actually win if you get lucky. After you charge a few times, you're basically set to wipe him out with a single multi-bonk. He can enable counter status for himself, but it is pretty rare that he will actually do it. But if he doesn't, just use one of the many items you get from the Palace of Shadow to then wipe out all of his Grotus Xs and then finish him off with a single multi-bonk. This does take a lot of luck, but something that I realized while looking back at the video feed, I remember that Grotus will always start off by using Lightning, which will always do 7 damage to both Mario and his partner. So if you really wanted to, you could just start the battle with Gubella only having 9 HP instead of having her max at 30, not guard the lightning, and you're already primed to be in peril on the second turn. So in reality, this battle is pretty much free, which is great because we immediately afterwards have to battle Bowser and Kami Koopa. With Bowser's high damage output and Kami Koopa's support and being able to either status Bowser to give him more buffs, or even being able to do more damage herself, or you know, healing him, you absolutely have to pull some very dirty tricks here. By the way, how many times should I say absolutely in this video? Real problem here is that I just cannot really do very much to out damage Kami Koopa without charging to a ridiculous amount. Healing at 8 HP at a time is not a small amount, and it necessitated using multi bonk in order to keep her HP down and knock her out. But this clearly was not going to be enough to work. Bowser himself has defense and much higher HP at a whopping 70 compared to Kami Koopa's 50. And it got to the point where I ended up being forced to keep using Super Garage because my health was just so low, I was going to fall to another Fire Blast like nothing else. I win the fight, but it just doesn't feel right to me. I started this challenge trying to not use Super Garage whatsoever, at least not to the point where it'd be like, if I don't, I lose. So even though we were already ready to fight the final boss, the Shadow Queen, I decided to reset and instead try this fight again just to not use super guards whatsoever. Which was a shame because I actually got very lucky with my stopwatch and I managed to get them both immobilized. But I also made some really big misplays like forgetting to equip double dip. So I ended up having a lot of trouble with using items quickly enough. So yeah, I absolutely did not deserve to win that battle. So we're going to try it again and hopefully not to use super guards this time around. And I just kept losing and losing and losing and they were not really getting much better and i realized then i really really had to think of an idea for this fight because it was just not going to work to brute force it heck my first attempt where i won i got a mushroom bingo and healed myself up to max hp so there was no doubt in my mind i absolutely had to think of another way of getting around this fight like just look at this i cannot afford at all for kami kuba to attack Gumbella even a single time i only have just enough hp to survive on a single hit point to take Bowser's Fire Breath without guarding and three bites. Anywhere to that from Kami Koopa, and I'm done. While the Vulture was very useful in keeping Bowser's AI locked and just using his bite over and over and over again because of recoil, it made this strategy extremely inflexible because if Kami Koopa attacks Kubella even a single time, it fails. And that guarding could leave me getting poisoned by Bowser's bite. Feeling fine can help against this, but for whatever reason, it also counts against being electrified, so I can't be electrified when I try using this badge. I don't understand why. It's not paralysis. I should be able to use it without any consequence. Which is a shame, because if I could take full damage from Bowser's Bite on occasion, I could be more flexible with how much damage I take from Bowser's Bite. There exists another item which I basically never use, and it's called the Spite Pouch, which you can thankfully find just before the Pirate's Grotto and Peel Hall Key. So 20 minutes of backtracking later and I get the item. Now I'm all the way back here because yeah, there's just no way of going back and forth very quickly in this game, but oh well, it's the game that we play. And soon enough, and by soon enough I mean eventually, we get an attempt where despite our attacks that not quite being high enough, but not also having the time to be able to charge anymore, because Kamikuba did not heal Bowser that turn, we were able to wipe him out with one more multi-bonk. 
Kami herself, however, went invisible, so I could not touch her, and I ended up using my Ultra Shroom, which fortunately, I have plenty of these, so if I didn't use it, I'd have gotten knocked out because she does attack Umbella before too long, at least before she becomes visible again. So as far as I'm concerned, it was necessary, and we really lose no sleep over it anyway. So, oh well. At least this is a fight I can be proud of. Now for the final boss of the game, the Shadow Queen. For this fight, I started off with only having 5 HP and Goombella so that she could be in danger right away. With P at the on P, no matter whether or not I choose to guard, if she attacks Goombella, I will always end in peril, so there's nothing to worry about. Two more head bonks, and we're already in the phase two. I use one of my shooting stars just to trigger her attack, then boost she, and I just keep attacking until she ends up eating the audience. Yes, I did just say that. This game is freaking weird and I love it. Several minutes of unskippable cutscenes later, and we're finally getting ready for the final part of the final boss. Since the Shadow Queen is a charge attack that does a whopping 15 damage if I don't guard it on Goombella, I exploit the scripted shine sprite bingo that happens after I attack three times, using charge for one turn and then nothing but multi bonk until that bingo goes off. From there, I end up being very liberal with my FP, and I just keep using my multi bonks until I only have 4 FP left. By the time this happened though, my HP was also just way too low, but I had plenty of life shrooms, so I let Goombella get knocked out instead, just because I had so many life shrooms in my bag already, and once I got revived, I double dip both a boost sheet as well as a point swap. Since after the double dip I only have 1 FP left, I'm able to swap my FP and my HP to immediately have only 1 hit point left, but also having 10 FP, and 2 multi bonks after that, and the battle is over. Despite just how much more reliant Goombella has been on buying items from shops, she has finished this challenge in a much lower level than Coop Tattoo, which is to be expected because they have very, very different weaknesses and strengths. Coops is meant more to be able to sweep rows of enemies like they're nothing, but Goombella excels when it comes to bosses just because of how much damage she can do when she charges up. But when comparing these two, which one reigns supreme? Honestly, while it can be a bit of a tough call to make, I think that Goombella just really, really takes the cake here because she does not have to level up much at all. In fact, I was actively avoiding fights, which granted she couldn't really do much about anyway, but when it comes down to it, she didn't have to fight them anyway because Hoops had the grind at some points, and there were some areas where he was struggling because he did not have a higher level on him. But Kumbella just does not have that problem because she hits so hard. Currently, she's leading, and by no short tip either. But we still have five more partners to include. So when we return to Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, we'll be taking a look at the next partner in sequence, Flurry, because we already did Coops anyway. If you're interested, subscribe down below and click bell notifications because I absolutely will be streaming this challenge on my Twitch channel. Also, follow me there if you're interested in just checking this challenge out when it's live. And yeah, I'll see you all later. Thanks for watching.